Hi, and uh, welcome to the Photoshop Show, episode 63. And I'm really excited tonight to uh, uh, be the guest as well as the host. Jen, you know, hopefully she's going to be able to get in, but Jen has been, we've been having a little bit of trouble with um, Hangouts tonight, and uh, so hopefully she can get in. She has a bunch of invites sent. She's been in once, but it hasn't worked. So otherwise, Jen, we'll look for you in the, in the comments. Hopefully you can comment from there, but keep trying to get in. Um, I have a number of guests here with me tonight, all of which have something in common besides Google+. Plus. Um, all, all of the people here are somehow involved in some way with the Arcanum, which we're all very excited about, which is uh, Trey Ratcliffe, uh, Curtis Simmons, and Peter Giordano's uh, fantastic online uh, mentoring program uh, that works through, uh, right currently through Google Communities. Hi, Jan. It We're worked. live. Just thought I'd let you know. I was just talking about how we're all connected other than through G+, through the Arcanum. Yeah, and so Jan has invited uh, Diana Boyd, one of her students, to join us. And I've uh, invited Larry and Marjorie, two of my students, to join. And Erica is uh, an up-and-coming um, master candidate in the Arcanum. And she's going to be taking on a cohort of her own in the future. And we're really, really excited about that. And of course, uh, Jan, you already are a, a master in the Arcanum teaching a cohort of your own. So hi and welcome, Jan. I'm sorry there were so many problems. Oh, it's fine. We're used to it. It's Google+. Plus. That's the way it works. Yeah. I wanted to especially welcome Diana Boyd. Hi, Diana. How are you? We can't hear you because you're... Hi, you're... Jan. <laughs> Hi, this is so great to see you here. I just thought it'd be so great for Diana to come and join us on the panel, Ron, because I know that she really is interested in luminosity masking, and she was so excited when she saw you posting the event that she was telling everyone about it. So I thought, hey, perfect guest. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and welcome, Diana. Uh, now, you and I have known each other for some time now, um, which I don't know if Jan knew, but you're also a former student of mine in the G Plus mentorship programs and have, I think, also worked under some other mentors in the G Plus program as well. Um, so just give us your little hi. I'm, I'm, I'm Diana, and uh, you know I've been on G Plus so long, and I love photography, Spiel. Hey, I've been on G Plus oh, probably three years now, I guess. Almost the beginning. And uh, I started getting into the G Plus mentorships right away as soon as they started and um, I've enjoyed them so much and now I'm in the Arcanum under Jan so that is just so special um, I, I took photography in college for um, commercial photography and art and then when everything became digital I quit until I got back on G Plus and got yeah. a digital camera I can relate to that. I'm, I'm glad you got back into digital, and I'm glad that all of us here found G Plus pretty early on. Most of us, anyway. I, I'm going to come across, and I'm, I'm going to pick on the uh, the students first. I'm going to say hi to Marjorie there. Although I see her avatar, she might not be live right now. Are you there, Marjorie? I'm not there right now. There's a bit of an issue, so I'll skip over to Larry. Hi there, Larry. How are you doing? I'm doing good today. Uh... I've uh, been in photography for the last three years since I uh, uh, retired, and uh, I joined the uh, Arcanum under uh, you, Ron, and have, uh, my photography has really bloomed since I've joined the Arcanum. I had a great time, so that's kind of it for me. Yeah, well, good to have you. Larry, you uh, had a special thing happen. It's happened to a number of us here on G+. Plus just last week at Photoshop World. Um, you got to meet a couple of people. Yeah, it was it was really great. Uh, you know, we've been having our, our hangouts here on G, uh, Google Plus, and I had noticed how, you know, it's, it's so much different than using a telephone or, or messaging that you actually get to know somebody, and that was really brought home to me when uh, at Photoshop World uh, this last week, two of our uh, uh, members of our cohort, uh, uh, Stephanie and Isabel came to Photoshop World and we met and it was like meeting your long-lost relatives. I mean, it, it was, we knew each other. 
and it was like we were immediately immediately up around each other's necks and just hugging and and uh, <laughs> it was actually wonderful. I, I think a lot of us can echo that same feeling that when we uh, met in real life for the first time, and some of us still haven't, but when we did. It was just like meeting an old friend for the first time, and it's a very unusual experience. Isn't that right, Marjorie? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely and, uh, accurate. I, there's no other way to describe it than that. It's exactly what it's like. So. Yeah. I had the good fortune of meeting Marjorie at our one of our photo walks this year, and I've seen uh, her twice now, and we're going to meet up again In my uh, little later, later this month. Uh, right? October. It's October, okay. October. And so... Yeah, the miracle of, of Google Plus just keeps chugging along. Um, I came close to meeting Erica in real life, but that, that'll come up again. We'll get back down there. And, and you too, Jen. I would love to do something in Colorado, Jen. Well, get on down here. It's great. I know. We'd just, love to just have you. Maybe, I think we need, a, we need a photo walk um, led by Ron Clifford. What do you guys think? Absolutely. In Colorado, yeah. That would be good. I love it's it. Great on that. It's a helicopter yeah. in. Yeah, we'll get Trey to pull us all in by yeah. <laughs> Get a rabbit out of his hat. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, the reason we're all here tonight, I, I'm just going to get down to it. I, I do appreciate the introductions, but I don't want to wait too long before talking about luminosity masks. And this came up in our last show, the idea of luminosity masks, and there's different ideas about what they are and how they're used. Um, and so I want to I approach it First, just with some basic definitions so that we're all talking about the same thing. Because it's a little bit of a mystery. It's kind of like the new it's like the new shampoo on the shelf or, or it's like that new cell phone. Everybody's got to have one, but they don't quite know why they got to have it. And so everybody's talking about them. There's lots of videos being produced. There's, a, there's a two or three key people in the industry that have been real proponents of them for quite some time. Uh, Tony Kupier, I think is, is how you say his last name, uh, is a real pioneer in luminosity masks. Uh, Sean uh, Bagshaw, Bradshaw, Bagshaw, Bradshaw, I have the links over here, I should read them. Um, it is Sean, and I'm sorry if he watches this and I got his name wrong. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Uh, so yeah, it's Bagshaw. Sean Bagshaw has a, a complete guide to luminosity masks. And I'll be sharing either the links in the show while we're talking, or if I don't have time, I'm going to be putting them on the event. Anything I share from links tonight will go on to the event. I just didn't have a, enough time ahead of time to get them ready just to cut and paste. And then there's Jimmy McIntyre, who does uh, uh, yeah, a great uh, contributes to Shutter Evolve, which is a great blog, and does his own website, uh, throughstrangelenses.com. And he has a, a fantastic tutorials on luminosity masking. And uh, I bring him up because I love his accent. Uh, he's Irish or Scottish. I'm not sure which, but he's got a great accent. And he's fun to listen to when he teaches. And one definition uh, I'm, I'm going to make clear is that luminosity masks are, are not masks specifically for luminosity. They're actually just for digital. They can be used for digital blending. They can be used to mask any adjustments. A luminosity mask is just a way using luminosity in an image to create a Photoshop mask. If we if we think about what a luminosity mask is, very simply, that's all it is. It's just a way to create a mask in Photoshop using luminosity. Now, the name luminosity is another thing that we should look at. And uh, I have a little, a couple definitions that are really make it really super unclear. I'll make it clear in a second. Um, in in one at, on dictionary.com, it said uh, a state or quality of radiating or reflecting light. So how does that work? Uh, it doesn't really quite fit with what we're doing. Although luminance, luminosity is a state of reflected light. Uh, luminance itself is a measure in candles per square meter of the brightness of a, a particular point on a surface that's radiating, radiating. So luminance is actually a measurable reflectance but still not quite what we're looking for. And so I, I began to look through, and I finally went, got down to the freedictionary.com, and in number four in the freedictionary.com under luminosity, under general physics, it says the attribute of an object or color enabling the extent to which an object emits light to be observed. That sounded more like it. So now we're observing 
a level of light. I'm going to simplify this really quickly now. So um, luminosity simply, when we look at a digital file, is the differences we see in the tonal range of an image. We hear people talk about EVs, exposure values, and that, well, my Nikon has 14 exposure values. Well, those could also be considered luminosity steps in your image. Luminosity is simply differenti differentiating tonal values in your image. And so I'll often use the term tonal range or dynamic range or value for, for the word luminosity as I go forward. And so I just want to make it clear that although the masks I'm discussing are created by defining a specific area of luminosity and then creating a mask, the purpose is not specifically to adjust luminosity. It's simply to create the mask, like I mentioned before, and then you can use that mask to target any adjustment that you want to use. And so that's exciting because often, for example, and I'll show in my when I do the demo, you might want to um, do your noise reduction only in your shadows where the noise is bad and not in your highlights. That's a tough mask to make, I've got to tell you, if you're trying to do that by hand. But with luminosity masks, you can isolate the shadow range you want to apply your adjustment to very specifically. And that's the power. That's what everybody gets really excited about with luminosity masks. And so I'm going to go over four reasons why. That's what they are. They're a mask. You create them from the tones in your image. I, I'm going to. I, I, I'm looking to the side because I have notes that I'm following to stay on track because I can get off track. Ask one of my students, Mark Helm. He knows. He's been in a lot of hangouts with me. So, why use luminosity masks over other styles? There's lots of ways to make masks. Um, many of my students have, have participated in Layers, Masks, and Modes, which is a mentorship I run, and I cover using different methods of making masks and even combining them. But the reason you would use luminosity masks over any other types, I came up with four excellent reasons. One, they have graduated edges that are a perfect representation from the values that you have in your picture, matching the shapes and textures that are in your photograph. And so uh, to distill that, they just make a beautiful graduated gray tone mask instead of a hard edged mask from specific areas of your own image. So you don't have to hand paint them out. You don't have to try complicated masking techniques. You just choose the right tonal range. It will create the mask. Number two, they isolate very specific areas based on the tonal values within the image you're editing. And so if you only want to have an adjustment affect a specific value range, this is one of the best ways to do it. And like I had mentioned earlier, let's say you wanted to uh, adjust just the bad digital noise in the shadows. You could make a luminosity mask just for that. Number three, you want natural looking HDR images without using dedicated programs to use it. This is a huge one. This is a lot of what uh, Sean uh, Bagshaw and Jimmy McIntyre go on about digital blending is taking two or more images with different exposures and combining them without using photomatics or HDR um, effects pro or uh, HDR pro 32-bit processing in Photoshop or Lightroom. It allows you to work within Photoshop to create a higher dynamic range or, or, or simulate a higher dynamic range by combining images in a very natural way. And that's a big one probably the most complicated one of them all. It does take some that, practice. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> totally different from what I've heard of before and I'm excited to see more about that. That's really cool. Good. And then, yeah, and this is why I wanted to kind of distill it into four reasons why because everybody knows kind of what they are, not quite, but don't know why they're going to use them. So number four, whenever the distinct brightness in an area of your picture would make a great mask, like a white shirt, if a, a guy's wearing a white shirt and the whole picture is gray, to make a mask of that, you could make a, a, a bang on mask using luminosity. There's other ways, but this is one way. And so those are the four. And so I mentioned the most common use is using two or more bracketed images. Yeah, yeah. Could you repeat the four for people who just want it now? They've heard it just like bang, bang, bang. What are the four? Yeah. What I wanted to do, I want to set this up like the Patels do so I can have me logged in with a slideshow that I have beside me, but I didn't master it tonight. That's okay. 
And so one, uh, it's, they, they're a mask with a graduated edge that's a perfect representation from values in your own image. So you're not having to create or paint it yourself. Uh, they isolate very specific areas, very similar to number one, within the tonal range of the image you're editing. So if you want to target that specific tonal range, like just the shadows for noise, this is an excellent way to do it. Number three, it's, it's probably the best way to create a natural looking HDR image, but it is not simple and takes some practice. I would have to say that it, I would consider this an advanced Photoshop technique, not something if you're not comfortable with layers, masks, and selections. I, I would probably get the fundamentals before you move on to this. But it's not impossible, and I know Larry's played with them, and he's done a great job with them, and he's pretty new to them, so nothing's impossible. And so four, uh, whenever the distinct brightness of an area, or darkness for that matter, it doesn't have to be bright, if uh, would make a great mask, like a white shirt or a black shirt or a black rock or, you know, a, a, just a specific tonal range would make a perfect mask for you. I would go right away to luminosity masks as one of the go-tos for me. Thank you. Okay. Now, I want to break into a demonstration and I want to uh, uh, cover just a couple of things. And that's not exclusive. That's not the only uses. You can experiment to begin to play with them. But I wanted to clarify, and that was really important for tonight's show, uh, I didn't want to make it too wordy, but I really wanted to be clear about what the word luminosity mask is, and then demonstrate a couple of ways to use them. Um, and I'm going to break into that now. I just want to shout out to Ray, who's in the chat, another former student. Uh, how you doing, Ray? Good to see you. Um, and I, I can do a screen share. I've done this before. I'm pretty pretty sure I know how to do this. I'm going to move you guys over to a different screen. And feel free to interrupt me. I, 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 I get a little little disoriented, but I, I catch on pretty quickly. So screen one, share. And so loading up, you have my... Lightroom. Hopefully you have my Lightroom. Um, and what I have in Lightroom if, is I've isolated some images that might make some pretty excellent demos for luminosity masking. Um, I'm just going to mute you for a sec, and I'm getting feedback. I'm not sure where from. Let's see if that's it. And so here I've got an image, and uh, I'll just click over to... Um, that is the raw image. I want to kind of get it more like this image beside. So um, this is an example where in this image, and I know by my file name, I actually processed this through an HDR program because it shows me my file number with three extensions, so I used three images. But I don't want to do that. I just want to load this up because really, if I look at um, the histogram, it has all the the detail in it. I haven't lost highlights and I haven't lost shadows in my image. So it technically has all the information to create an image with more dynamic range and more contrast and structure. Um, so I'm going to do this just as a one-off. Just we're going to hit this, we're going to take it into Photoshop and we're going to see how we compare doing it with a luminosity mask. Um, when I do this, I do want to share one little trick, and, and I stumbled across this because some of us use Photoshop CS6, some of us use Photoshop CC, and some of us use Photoshop CC 2014. As some of you using 2014 have learned, not everyone has caught up to writing extensions for Photoshop 2014. So I'm going to show you how to do this uh, both ways, but how to set up Lightroom to open it up either in Photoshop CC or 2014, because you can have them both installed on your computer. I do now. And so when, when I right-click on an image and I want to edit it in Photoshop, I get uh, a window come up that says Edit In. Now the first one, since yesterday when I installed CC 2014, my only choice at the time was to open it in Photoshop CC 2014, which was frustrating because I couldn't run my nice little utility extension <clears throat> that was in Photoshop CC. 
So what I did was I installed it as an edit in option in Lightroom. Now I really want to cover this because a lot of people were having this thing with, oh, it doesn't run in Photoshop 2014. And, and yes, it does, but it just doesn't run the extension. But let me show you how to set Lightroom up so you can either run 2014 or CC if a lot of the extensions that you were using in CC haven't yet caught up to 2014. Can I just interrupt and say something, Ron? Yeah. This, um, by the way, is the subject of that book that I wrote, which is how you use Lightroom and Photoshop together. And what you're about to show is how to set up Lightroom to use the primary external editor, which is always the latest version of Photoshop on your computer, which is why it always says CC 2014 for those who have that version. And then how to go to the next step and add an additional external editor. You're going to use Photoshop CC as your second editor. But, you know, the point is if anybody wants more on this, <clears throat> excuse me, they can go and get the, um, what did I call that book? The Adobe uh, Lightroom and Photoshop for Photographers Classroom in a Book. And that's what it is all about. Excellent. Yes. Thank you, Jan, because uh, one thing I've learned in, in using Lightroom over the years is that it's, it's a lot deeper and more robust than at first looks. And having a resource like that is phenomenal in, in, in navigating the issues. Um, so here we go. I'm just going to see Macs and, and uh, PCs have these in different places. But just go to your Lightroom preferences. In, in PCs, it's under Edit. And I think in Macs, it's just under the File dropdown. But you're going to see here that under External Editing here, if we go down to external, additional external editor, it has a custom section. And we can tell it to add an external editor like Photoshop CC instead of 2014 or any other program that isn't a natural plugin by going and choosing where that application is. And so we go into here, and I happen to know, uh, for me, it's in, in my C drive in program data, Adobe. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, where is it? It's program files, Ron. Oh. Oh, I hit program data, didn't I? You're right. <laughs> program files, Adobe. And here I have Adobe Photoshop CC 64 bit. That's my traditional CC before it upgraded to 2014. If I open that folder and I scroll down, I find the executable file right here. I choose that and I click open. I've already done it, so I won't. And that puts it here as a program that I can use to open files in. And so uh, that's just a, a tip for you so you don't get frustrated thinking, oh, I wish I still had my CC. As long as you didn't uninstall it, you still do have it and you can access it there. Okay. I'm so, breaking one more time. I'm so sorry, but I just yeah. wanted to say for Mac users, um, that uh, executable file, the the, pro, the file that starts um, Adobe Photoshop CC is in a different location than uh -oh. on Windows. It's in Application Support Adobe. Thank you. That's why it's good to have two people here using different platforms. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to uh, right-click this, and then I'm going to say Edit In, and I'm going to choose Photoshop which is the regular one. And I'm going to say uh, edit a copy. Uh, I could just say edit original. I'm actually going to do that. I'm just going to edit the original and uh, uh, without getting into a whole lot of reasons. Um, I already have it loaded here, so let me just get rid of these things because the original is already here. So here's the original file here. What I've done is already um, I've taken it, and let me flatten this image for a second. I'm just going to use a, a shortcut for myself called Flatten, so it looks like it will for you. It's a background image, and it's locked. Um, we can't do certain things on a locked image, so right away I like to make my background a layer. So one of the simplest ways to do that is just to hold my Alter Option key and double-click it, and it just goes to layer zero. It becomes an unlocked layer, and I can do a lot more with it. A lot of people like to copy this layer, so that they're not affecting the original layer. And you can do that just by right-clicking, and you can say Duplicate Layer. Or uh, another way to do that here, Duplicate Layer, or press Control or Command-J. And so we'll just say, OK, uh, I'm not going to worry too much about labeling at this point. 
It's just going to be my copy layer. That's what I'm going to work on. So right now in this image, you can see that there's a clear distinction between the value range or the luminosity of the water and the value range or luminosity of most of the other image. It's This would make a great candidate to use a luminosity mask to isolate the water or the snow to create adjustments. And so the way I do that is to make a set of luminosity masks. Now, as much as I, I, I would like to say, oh, I know how to do this manually, and I'm going to show you in the next three hours how I create manual luminosity masks, all 18 of them. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. There's a really easy way. One way is if you have Photoshop CC, you can use uh, Jimmy McIntyre's free Easy Panel. And as long as you have installed, let me go here and, and go into the mode you would most likely uh, no, is if you've installed his luminosity masks here as an action, then you can just go to this panel and click create luminosity masks. Now I don't want to get into it telling you how to do this. If you go to Jimmy McIntyre's uh, uh, tutorial on this and free download, it includes all the instructions for this panel. Um, so just to let you know, it's just important that don't just install the panel, you also need to install the Luminosity Masks action. Now I'm going to click that Easy Panel, and I'm just going to say Create Luminosity Masks. What's happening in the background, I'm going to go to my Channels panel over here. Mine may be in a different place than yours, but it's busy creating our Luminosity Masks for us. So it's, it's a pretty quick process. It doesn't take too long. And it creates a whole bunch of them for us. Now, I'm just going to click on one mask right away here, and you'll notice that it's black and white. Masks are made from black and white or any gray tone in between. And so um, these are all luminosity masks, and you'll see that they have labels, brights, and stuff. And that's not as important as understanding just that I'm looking for a mask that reveals the area I want to edit. So in masks, black conceals, white reveals. And so I'm looking for a mask that mostly conceals the snow, but mostly reveals, mostly conceals the snow and mostly reveals the water. And so probably this one is a good candidate. Even though it's not ideal, it's a pretty good candidate. So what I'm going to do, and follow me carefully here, is use Control or Command right click over the mask. And I'm in my Channels panel, just to be sure. Here's my Layers panel. Here's my Channels panel. I'm on my mask. And I Control click, and you'll see we get Marching Ants. If you can see that here. We get our Marching Ants, which is an indication I've made a selection. But what I need to do is get that selection over to my layers, which it is because I've control clicked. So if I go back to layers and I click on my layer I'm working on, you'll see my selection has been moved to my layer. But what I want really is a mask. There's two ways I can do this. If I want to mask directly over this layer, I just click my mask icon at the bottom. Looks like a little camera or washing machine. And it creates my luminosity mask right there. If I alter option, click on that mask, we'll see it. That's it right there. And it's you need on. the applause button. I don't know what the applause sound is. <laughs> <laughs> so there I have a mask. Now that's not the only way to do it. That would be great if I want to use that image specifically for the adjustment. Another way to do it, let me delete that. Um, let me highlight it and delete that mask for a second. We'll go back and we'll just reload that um, controller command, click reload it, go back to my layers and select. While it's selected, I can choose any of my adjustments here to, to use. And, and right now, I think I want to create a brightness contrast adjustment. It's one of my first go-to adjustments. It's pretty simple. And so now you see it's attached itself to my brightness and contrast um, adjustment layer right here for me already. And now when I adjust my brightness or contrast, you can see that it's affecting 
a little bit of everything because my mask is not pure black and white. But it's mostly affecting the water. And I actually kind of like the way it's affecting a little bit of everything. But it's too much in my white area. But if I just look at before and after here, and I'm just going to alter option click on my uh, indicator on the last layer, you can see the adjustment I've made. Look specifically to the water. And so one of the things I can do, and this is really important when dealing with a luminosity mask, and this comes from a previous show that Claudia McHugh did. She taught us a really great trick, and I'm going to isolate my mask by, by clicking Alt or Option Click. And what I want to do is actually create more of a black and white mask. Follow me here. I want to go up to Image, Adjustments, and Levels. And using this Levels dialog, and without first having to paint a whole bunch of stuff, I can create a more distinct mask just by, by moving my levels and playing with that until I get a more distinct mask of the area I want to control, like that foreground water. Do you see how those levels are affecting that? Creating more of a black and white mask the more I fiddle with it? I'm going to click OK. And now, I'm, while I'm still on that mask, I'm going to grab my paintbrush and I'm going to paint with black because I want to conceal this cliff region and I only want the water left. And so now that my mask is very isolated, I can really quickly, using 100% flow and opacity at the top, just brush out where I don't want any more of the mask. But now it's really easy to keep it from contaminating the area and it gives me a really natural mask just on my water without having to get into the fussy details of all these little textures and techniques. So now I'm going to Alt-click. Now let's look at the difference before and after. See it's just affecting the water. Now follow this here. I'm going to go back to my original layer. And I'm going to do, a, I think, a saturation and vibrance adjustment. But you see how now it doesn't remember the selection I had. I have a regular mask now over that adjustment. But I really want to use the mask that I already have. I don't want to create a new one. I can easily use this one by clicking op Option or Alt and dragging it on top of the mask I want to change and letting go. You know, it's all those little simple things. Yeah, there's a lot packed into this and that's why I'm glad you can replay it over and over. And I'm, I'm really trying to approach this methodically like Jan does <laughs> she's my she's my master of lesson here she's she's the best at this so when I dragged and dropped that onto my empty mask it asked me if I want to replace the mask and I say yes and so now I have another mask exactly the same as the previous one fantastic so now to get back to my adjustment it's opened up here if I ever actually lose that adjustment, I can just double click on the adjustment little icon, double click, and it's back. And I'm going to adjust my just my vibrancy. That saturation tends to really overgo some things, really blows out color channels. My vibrance is a little more delicate, so I'm just going to pull that up a little bit. And that's all I want to do there. So whoops, close that back in. And let me just show you what that's done. Just look to the water. Um, there and there. Actually, it didn't make as much of a difference as I wanted. Let me just tune it up a little more. I do have to create a bit of a saturation adjustment. There. And so we'll just go into there. And there's a very subtle change in the water just to create a bit more aqua. Let's say now I want it to affect everything but the area I just did. Uh, show of hands, who knows the fastest way for me to make a mask to work on now the opposite of what I just worked on? Larry, let's let's try Larry. Don't forget to unmute. Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> just make the mask like you just did and then uh, invert it. Exactly. That would probably be the fastest way. So 
Um, let's do that. Let's create another adjustment layer. And let's say I want to, again, use um, brightness and contrast. Uh, for those who like curves, let's make a curves adjustment now. Let's drag by Alt, click and, and drop onto our curves adjustment mask and accept it by saying yes. And now while it's highlighted, I can invert this mask by pressing Control or Command I. Now that mask is going to flip for us and become exactly the opposite of the other mask. Let me um, let me make this just a little easier for you. I'm going to go into my properties, panel options here, and just use big masks so it helps us see better. There they are. And so now this mask is an exact negative opposite of the mask I just had. And I can take my curves adjustment if you don't see it, if you see this dialog and you don't see your curves adjustment, you can just click up here on your little icon and it'll bring it up for you. And so now I can give a little bit more of a contrasty curves adjustment by giving a bit of brightness and bring down my shadows just a bit. Maybe a little too bright actually, right about there. And we'll say that's okay. So now what I've, what I've done is I've created an image with a little more dynamic, apparent dynamic range by giving it its brightest highlights and darker shadows, more contrast, and saturation only in the area that I wanted it to be in using luminosity masking. Okay, let me just pop out of there for a second. Before I pop out, in case I need to show, are there, are there any questions there? Or I'll just, uh, I'm going to glance over into um, into our chat as well just to see no okay I guess what I would say about it is everything um, that you're showing us uh, is true regardless of whether the mask you're using is based on the luminosity of the image whether it's just one that you paint with a brush or make with a selection the unique piece is the creation of the mask based upon the luminosity values in the image to start with that's right, and so um, I just want to check on our time because we are we're probably going to go over an hour if I showed you quickly how to combine two images. It might be best saved to leave it at that for this show because it is so in depth. But I do want to show you how to create the luminosity masks without this extension. That's right. very important. And so let me just uh, back out of what I've done. I'm going to not stop screen sharing. I'm just going to back out of what I've done. And I'm going to um, undo some of this. Here, let me just pull these down. And so from here, if my, um, well, for example, let me let me just remove it from here. I'm going to delete that from here. If I don't have those there, first of all, if you're using CC, let me back up. If you're using Photoshop CC and not Photoshop 2014, and you've installed the Easy Panel and you click it, and uh, let me see, I might have to restart. It might not know this, but you click it, and you create luminosity masks, and it gives you this error. This command is currently not available. It's because you still haven't installed the action the one I just removed. One of the easiest ways I know of to install an action, and I happen to have my folder of actions open, is to locate where your unzipped actions are, or where you've unzipped them to, and you simply need to find that action. And so where do we have the luminosity action? Actions, easy panel, it's easy to find it here. Here's it here, JM Luminosity Mask. Just drag and drop it right on your Actions panel. And there it is. And so if we're in CC 2014, rather than use this little, um, uh, I just lost the name for it. It's an action. It's, what's it called? An, uh, what are the extension? There's the word. It's an extension. I can simply use it as an as a, as a old standby action and just click it 
right here by highlighting the action and clicking the play button. And that's how you would do it if you don't have the easy panel extension. And if we look back here, it's busy building for us the luminosity masks right there. No, I don't want to save this lecture right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, the last thing I want to leave you with is it's very important that you delete the luminosity masks after you finish using them. If you come down here and look at this document size, it started as 138 megabytes. It's now 2.28 gigabytes. You don't want to save that file. <laughs> you want to delete the masks. Well, how do you delete the masks? Fortunately for us, uh, uh, us fortunately for us, uh, Jimmy McIntyre included a number of other free actions, and one of them is delete luminosity masks. I'm going to drag it over and drop it in. I'm going to highlight that action and play it, and it will automatically delete the masks now that I'm finished with them but it will not delete the ones I had brought over and used on my layers panel. It'll only delete the ones created in the channels panel. So we're safe. You don't have to worry about flattening your file or losing your masks over here on your layers panel. Okay. And that, my friends, is as basic as I can make luminosity masks for you. And there's a number of gems in there about how to work with your masks once they've been created. Because like Jan said, luminosity masking is really only that step of clicking this generate luminosity masks and choosing which ones are appropriate for the adjustment I'm making. Everything from that point on is just working in masks and selections. And, and I was going to say also the episode before was teaching us how to create our own luminosity masks and add alpha channels if you don't have the extensions. So if you want to know more in depth about that, watch last week's episode. Yeah, last week's episode. And I would love to do a complimentary episode to this, identifying a couple of other different images and, and using it to combine for natural looking HDR. Now, I don't know. I, I guess if we got into the technical part of it, we're not actually creating an HDR image because we haven't increased the dynamic range here. We've increased the appearance of the dynamic range. When we use two or more images, I don't even know still if it's HDR or if we're just digitally blending. HDR happens when an image is tone mapped through an algorithm in a program like Photomatix. Uh, so I, thought, I thought the HDR was any time that you increase the range that you could get with a single photo. No matter how you did it. Yeah, I, and maybe you're right, Larry. I, I'm not. I'm, I can be absolutely wrong on this, but I, I suspect that HDR actually has to do with working in the 32-bit color space that actually has more range than we can visibly see on our monitors. Um, I think that's the technical side of it, where we're actually just digitally blending images in 16-bit mode. Well, Ron, let me ask you, how long would it take you to show us how to do this with more than one image? Because we have technically, you know, maybe 20 minutes that we haven't used left of the show. Would it take longer than that? You know what? If I was just doing it and I was editing and not explaining it, I could do it in 10 minutes. I suspect it's probably a half hour start to finish when I break into it. And I really want people to get the foundation of what we covered today. Well, so I have no love... problem doing another, like a part two of this at another time. That would be awesome. Yeah. That's the next step for me is blending images. Yeah, but I don't want to, I just don't want to saturate. I, I know there's that glazed over look people are about to get right about now. <laughs> I think it's perfect. I really do. I think that I, some little hints and little tips and just seeing the actions which I didn't even know existed really kind of helped me get moving more in the direction of using luminosity masks on a more regular basis. So I really appreciate this tutorial. Great. Now I am going to uh, put the links to the information in the chat, in the Hangout description, and on our YouTube video description so that they're not there immediately right now live, but very shortly 
they will be. You can go back and check, and that way you don't have to try and dig these links up all for yourself, including the link to the free actions panel and actions from Jimmy McIntyre. So, Ron, I think it'd be terrific if you did this. And, you know, we have another guest scheduled for next Tuesday. Yeah. But if you had free the following Tuesday, that would be terrific. Yeah, I, th I think that would be fine. I think I could do that without a problem. Cool. Um, I already actually, have it set up, so it's no problem at all. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you about this idea of creating your own luminosity masks without Jimmy McIntyre's thing. Um, you know, one way to do that is to use existing color channels. Um, is, are there other ways in addition? Yeah, there are. There's, there's actually a way that I shouldn't say it's easy. I say it's easy because I have experience with Photoshop. Um, I understand Photoshop's not easy, and, and when what the issue with Photoshop is, a lot of this stuff for somebody who's experienced like you, Jan, seems fairly fundamental. And for me, and and for somebody learning, it looks fundamental when you watch it, and then you miss one little thing, and and the whole world collapses. You just I have a confession to, to make. I could yeah. never figure out how to copy a mask. I forgot. And so I didn't, you know, just having you say, hold down the alt while you go down, made me go, I've been fighting this forever. And it seems like such a silly question to ask somebody. And you know, and it, Erica, it's been incredibly frustrating. You know, uh, Erica, sorry, I had that highlighted on me, but I put it on you for a sec there. Um, what your experience is universal. There is nobody that doesn't have that frustration of missing one little thing and then spending an hour searching YouTube videos to figure out what it was that they're they're missing and you could be doing it for 10 years and it happens so this is actually an interesting topic and I do want to get back to the question you're going to answer though about other ways to make luminosity masks but I do want to say you know this is why when I teach Photoshop I make such a big deal all the time that you cannot memorize every little thing there is to do but what you can memorize are ways to find things like the command that you were missing, Erica. So, you know, one principle that everybody can always use is if something is missing, try right clicking on something. That's control clicking on a Mac on something that looks like it's involved. For example, if you wanted to remember how to copy a layer mask, try right clicking, control clicking on the layer mask and see what happens. Because those, uh, those are called contextual menus that pop up at that point and they usually do have commands related to whatever it is you just clicked on. So that's something that you could memorize, whereas you're not going to memorize the content of all contextual me menus. Yeah, that's a really good point. And didn't um, uh, Rich Harrington drove that home when he right clicked on a little icon and, and showed us a completely new panel um, just a few weeks back that, that I, I had no idea. I'm, not, I'm sure you knew it existed, but I had no idea there was even more in the layers panel than what was already there. Or it was the uh, levels panel, sorry, the levels uh, dialogue. Oh, right, those different ways to set up your, your yeah. uh, eyedroppers. But anyway, yeah. back, Ron, you're not going to sneak out of this. What, is, what are some other okay. ways? So, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, for those who really want the in-depth uh, how-to, um, I'll, I'll break into this for the next in the next show about the manual way to do it. And and Jimmy McIntyre again, I go back to him. He's he's given us a video that walks us through it. Um, but I'll just do one quick screen share because we do have a couple minutes. I'll just show you uh, how it, how it's done. Uh, I'll just I'll try and be really quick about this. I will be really quick. It's not it's not a complicated issue. So we'll share screen share. So here we are over in the channels panel, and let me uh, delete delete the the luminosity masks, and hopefully I get all the steps right when I roll D D select. I'm going to controller command click. Ah, I know what I did wrong. I'm going to go over this one more time. Controller command click to give me my marching hands. See, I missed one step. Yeah, there we go. I'm I'm living proof. I create the alpha channel, then I control Alt Shift click my alpha channel, and then click my next mask. So you see how now it's changing what it's selecting. Control Alt Shift click. My alpha two mask or or uh, selection, and then 
create my new alpha channel. And I'm going to control alt shift click on that one again create a new alpha channel and you can see as I go down it's changing the luminosity mask until eventually all I have left is pure white by the time we get to number six. <laughs> and then I'm wondering can you invert the mask and then it will go lighter and lighter each time? You got it. I wasn't going to get into this but let's go back to the RGB and let's control or command click that. Let's create alpha channel down here. Alpha channel 7. Now it's really yeah, good to start to question. name these things. How do you invert a mask? We're about to do that. A couple of ways. But this one, I'm just going to go up and I'm going to say select and I'm going to say inverse. If you ever want to know the shortcuts to things, if you're fairly new to Photoshop, often the shortcut will appear beside the control from the drop-down menu. So here it's shift control I or I wonder why it's doing shift control I. Anyway, shift control I and that will inverse my selection. And so that now, oh wait a second, back up. I want to do that while I'm up here on my RGB channel. So let's, again, control click. When I inverse my selection at this point, this is important, and then create my first dark mask. Now look at this mask. We've all seen what this looks like, like a film negative, an opposite mask of the first one I created up here of this one. And now all I do is the same process to create my, my mask for my darks. Uh, control, Alt, Shift, Option, uh, and Option, Shift, click and create the next one. So if we pull down here you'll see that creates that one and then we go down and down and down until we've done all the darks. That's how to create luminosity masks in these steps in, at, at the channel level. So I have a question. I missed something. Um, when you just went back that second time and you started creating your inverted channels, you um, here's the step I missed. I saw you do control or command click on the RGB channel thumbnail. Yeah. That gave you a selection of the luminosity values. And yeah. then you made a new inverted channel. How did you make that? Okay. Let me just go back here. Shift. I'll just walk through it really quickly one more time because I know a lot of people are really interested in this. Um, so I'm going to shift click or sorry control command click RGB channel and it, it creates my selection. I'm going to go up to select on my menu and select inverse and then create using the little uh, the create my new alpha channel and that's it there it created it. And then I can shift or I can pull alt shift click and then create my next mask and then control alt shift click and create the next mask and I do that seven times, six or seven times depending on the value range of my image. And it's gonna give me eventually it'll it'll only show me pure black, what what is pure black in my image. There, it's gone to pure black. So really, I only need five channels to get me to that level right there. Okay, so then my question is, why do you need all those if you're only going to use um, one, or I think you only well, use one for your layer masks? Yeah. yeah, you don't need them all, but you don't know exactly which one is going to be the most suited. And so if we ran an action to take the work out of all of this, then we can just look through them quickly and say, you know what, this one isolates for me the best, or this one, or that one. Gives me the best isolation of elements. And so that's why I would create all of them every time and then delete them after. But please don't forget to delete them after. <laughs> Great answer. Perfect so answer. Fantastic. I'm so happy. 
So we did yeah, we did have going over. That was worth this, this whole show. Just that last last thing you showed. Okay, and I please don't don't yell at me when you're frustrated because I forget steps on this part. This one, if you don't do it exactly following those steps, it will not work, and you'll you'll just be hitting your head against the wall. And I'm not responsible for thrown laptops, spilt coffee, or otherwise <laughs> stuff. You know, Diana Boyd has not asked a single question, and this is her big opportunity. Diana, do you have any questions for Ron? Oh, boy. Uh, I was taking notes, so, and I'm going to watch this again. Oh, great. Uh, no. Yeah, it's a lot to digest, I, I know, and that's why I tried to go through it in steps, and you can just back up and go forward. I have this grand plan. I have to. I have to confess. I have this grand plan to log in under me, and then log in under my other. My, my. What, what do they call that when you have a? Your doppelganger. Your mini me. Okay, mini me. We'll call it a mini me. I'm going to log under as my mini me too, and have my laptop running with slides, so that when I, when I, when I'm explaining something, I'll just pop up the slide briefly, so it can also be read or a quick screenshot that can be taken because I know you know it really helps when you can just see a quick slide about something while it's going on. I have a question. Yeah. Me or okay. Yeah. Um, so someone was saying something about different ways to create luminosity masks and my question is why? Are you still going to end up at the same point where you have those masks? What's the difference? Um those masks are pretty thorough in their luminosity separation. And so when you take one mask and you use it, and then you take the next mask for something else, it's they're all really well suited to that image perfectly. When you create them differently another way, and then another way, your masks aren't necessarily well meshed like they are in the luminosity panel. That's one answer, but it's it 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 um, one of my favorite ways to make masks is is um, using color range, for example, selection color range. That's my least favorite way. I gotta say. And but all that's doing is like if you're using brightness or midtones or darks, and then you you adjust that fuzziness, all you're doing is adjusting luminosity. I then I misunderstood. Then I thought you had said, or or maybe it was uh, Jan had said that there was different ways to create luminosity masks. Yeah, and last week's show, our our guest did show us a different way to create luminosity. But do you not? Do you end up at a, with different masks, or is the result different, or is the result the same as the masks that you were just showing us? I I think um, the mask shown last week was a one of thing. It wasn't a group of masks. It was a one of luminosity mask. Oh, okay. So well, it wouldn't have like we ran the action. We created them from white to black. Right. Okay. So, Ron, are you saying then that you think the method you showed us tonight really is the best method to get a mask that's suited to your image, to the actual tonal values in the image you're working on? better than the one-off way or the color range way or other methods. I think so. I think it's the um, when you're editing, when you're when you're just when you're in business in the business of photography, in the business of retouching, in the business of being paid for your time, I think this is the most efficient way. Because the action takes care of the work and all I'm doing is making my selection which is the most appropriate instead of fussing around and there's ways and this gets very deep I can I can combine several of those channels into one mask and it's very quick but I don't want to get into that tonight so there's ways to even go even further with how powerful this can be I noticed uh, one of the things Julia said was the easy panel no longer works with PS 2014 yes Julia um, I did in in the demo explain that you can run the action without using the easy panel um, and that's the great thing about it and I'm gonna post the links to that before before the show is or after the show is done before I go to bed tonight <laughs> at some point so I, I hope 
this has answered a lot of questions and I hope the video itself is a clear way to begin to really grasp why you would use luminosity masks and a few little extra tricks along the way. So Ronnie, you did such a great job. You can hear me, right? Yeah. You yeah. did such a great job of explaining it. Very good. I mean, really excellent. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is to say to people, there are no magic tricks in Photoshop. And I think sometimes um, uh, people make the error of forgetting to really learn the underpinnings. You know, what, for example, once you really understand what a layer mask looks like, what the black part does, what the white part does, what the gray part does, and the same goes for an alpha channel mask, and you understand that, then you're ready to go and start applying them and making your own luminosity masks and all of that. But I think one mistake people make is they jump to this sort of thing without getting those underpinnings. And as you rightly pointed out at the beginning, uh, to really understand this, you need to know what masks are, what layer, ma how to make layer masks, what they do, selections, all that stuff. You can't just like jump in and go, okay, luminosity masking, because you won't know what's going on. Does that make sense? I think you you put it clearly. Yeah. In in the next demo that I do on luminosity masks in a couple of weeks, I'm going to load up a, a zone system grayscale tab. You know, with the the black to white in squares with different tones and I'm going to run that action on those and that will really show you how the luminosity mask isolates values and um, that will be next time but you're right without having a basic the foundation of Photoshop and I say the, the foundation of Photoshop is masks, selections, blend modes and layers well layers first, layers, masks, selections and blend modes if, if you get a foundation in those, you will spend hours of unfrustrated time enjoying Photoshop. If, if you're missing one of those, it, it can really start to get complicated. I don't want to say that to discourage people, but to encourage them to just be patient while they get... I have a lot of friends who are lost there, and it's like they can't move past that, and they're landscape photographers, and they're amazing, but they can't move on. They haven't even... They can't get there, and so... It, it's it's nice to remember that we need to do the fundamentals before we can do these other techniques. But I think that Photoshop is amazing, but you're only scratching the surface if you don't use those um, those four things to their um, full stability. Yeah. Just and before you know, we sign off, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say I know you want to sign off, but just so people know, this also isn't uh, voodoo, and it isn't limited to only you know Ron and me and Erica and all you guys down there can learn this. Anyone can learn this. How did I figure this out? This is what I did. I treated it like a research paper and I went out and I read every single book that I could find that related to the subjects of masks, selections and channels. And you know, that was in the days of books. Nowadays I would spend more time looking at videos probably as well. Um, and I just gathered all the information as Ron did. You know, he gave you some resources. Go and look at those resources. It's worth your time so that you understand the underpinnings and not just the technique because as we've talked about you can't memorize it. Yeah, good point. And I, I have a little bit of shameless self-promotion. I have made a decision to run my Layers, Masks, and Modes uh, online program through the G Plus Mentorship Program. Um, and I'll probably make that announcement early uh, next week, maybe late this week. And I accept 10 students at a time for that. That's not a, one of the free mentorships, though. So I, I just want to let you know. If, I don't want you to be disappointed when you go over to the page. Uh, or over to my uh, website and, and discover there's a, a fee. It's a very reasonable fee, but it is a, a fee, so I just want to let you know that. But it builds the Photoshop foundations, uh, layers, masks, and modes, and we work with selections as well. Um, and I just want to put that out there because if that's something you're interested in developing, in in three weeks we, we cover one week of layers, one week masks, and one week modes, and we throw in some selections, uh, not advanced selections, but we throw it in enough to you build your foundation. Um, so if you're interested in that, just, just go on, uh, I guess the easiest way is to go to ronclifford.com and follow the, uh, the learning and mentorship links there. That's fantastic. Well worth your time. Ron is the most excellent mentor. He really knows how to teach, as you see, and he understands. So I urge everyone to do that. Okay. Well, that was, um, it did go a little longer. I really tried to condense it, like you say. It always goes longer than you think it will. Yeah. <laughs> I would really like to thank students and guests, uh, Marjorie and, and Larry and, and Diana, for uh,
contributing and joining. And, um, and I'm going to let you kind of sign us off so you can have the last word. Thank you. You know, I always have some more words, don't I? Um, I just wanted to um, do a little of my own, own uh, promotion here to tell people about a new uh, course that was just published on lynda.com. You know, I record these things quite a bit in advance, and so I'm sometimes surprised when they come out all of a sudden. Um, but this is one that I think that my Google Plus friends are really going to like. Can you see my screen right now? I tried to share it. Yeah, yeah, it's up there. Fine. So this is a course that just came out called Enhancing an Urban Landscape Photo with Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, this is for all my street photographer friends um, who love to go around and take pictures in the cities. And I show you know, kind of what I would do from start to finish with a single photograph um, using both Lightroom and Photoshop. So that's there for you. And the, as usual, there are some free movies involved in this course. Here you can see there's a long table of contents, but all the movies in blue here are free for people to watch. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, let me get out of there. It always takes longer to unscreen share than to screen share for me. Yeah, it does. Are we back? Yeah, we're back. We're back. Okay. Okay, so that's it for today. We'll see you all later. For those of you in the panel, you're welcome to hang out after I stop the broadcast. But thank you for joining me. I really, really appreciated your time. Thank you, Ron.